Hello everyone, and it's that time again. Welcome to the Sydney St. James Show. We sure appreciate you dropping in. Hello everyone, Sydney St. James with you for another exciting episode of The Making of an Author. Just the other evening, I was watching a story, or actually a movie, on television about the Alamo. And I saw Davy Crockett, and I saw Will Travis, and I saw many of the men that fought and died in the Alamo. I also watched them as they continued across the state of Texas, along with Sam Houston as their leader, until they stopped on a small bayou and the final battle of San Jacinto was held. Well, during all this time, I remember this is probably the fifth or sixth different version of the Battle of the Alamo and the Battle of San Jacinto, and very little in my upbringing in history or watching TV shows, we we see very little other than the women were sad when their husbands didn't return home after the Alamo. But there is so much more to it. You know, I wrote two books that I'll talk more about later called I Am Woman, uh, Hear Me Roar, that's one, and the sequel to it is I Am Woman, I Am Invincible. Now, I wrote both of those books because during this same era when Texas was fighting for its independence, did you know, and you almost have to go back in history because we definitely didn't live back there, right? But did you know that when a woman said and crossed the threshold and said, I do, she gave up everything she had. If she had a thousand acres of land and a thousand dollars cash or gold, probably is what it was then, the new husband got it all. Clear title. Got the money, stuck it in his pocket and got the land. And then if he wanted to hop on his trusty horse and ride away, He could, but she was left with nothing. Well, back to the Rose of Bray's Bayou. I talked about it in an earlier episode, but in this one, it's something that I think we need to take a look at, seriously, from the history. And I started out by saying, God bless the women of Texas. Well, At the second anniversary ball, to celebrate the victory of the Texians at the Battle of San Jacinto, General Thomas Jefferson Rusk walked across the floor and up to the podium. He looked over the crowd of people as it became silent and said, I would like to make a very special toast for our second anniversary ball. The men of Texas deserved much of the credit, but more was due to the many women across Texas. Armed men facing a foe couldn't but be brave. But, my friends here tonight, the women, the women with their little children around them, without means of defense or power to resist, faced danger and death with unflinching courage. God bless those women of Texas. This was said, jotted down, and kept for all time in the archives of Texas history. You know, in October in 1835, another thing that happened that was very interesting was the Federalists. Now, you get this. The Federalist forces, which is the same as the Federal forces, attempted to remove the town's cannon, like taking our guns away from us. Well, the women back then urged their dads, their husbands, their brothers to resist this. And after the firing of rifles between the Texans and the Mexican soldiers began, Naomi DeWitt took a pair of scissors and started cutting up her wedding dress and sewed together a flag that portrayed one single lone star. 
just like the Lone Star of the state of Texas now. And with it, there was an image of a cannon and a confrontational challenge in bold letters across the flag to the Mexicans that said, Come and take it. After the skirmish that day, many thought the war with Mexico was over until February the 24th, 1836. On that particular day, couriers rode into Gonzales with, not, with some not so good news. The Mission San Antonio de Valero, or as we all know it now from history, best known as the Alamo, was surrounded by the Mexican army and needed help. On February the 27th, every single able-bodied man rode to the aid of their fellow Texans in San Antonio. The women of Gonzales sat nervously for over two weeks awaiting news of their return. On March 13th, a scout came in there. His name was Erastus Death Smith. And one reason he was called Death Smith, because he was deaf but he was an excellent reader of lips. He arrived in Gonzales with Susanna Dickinson, who had been inside the Alamo throughout the 13-day siege and final assault, during which her husband was one of 185 men who were killed in battle. Accompanied by her infant daughter and Joe, Will Travis's slave, she arrived back in Gonzales. Now, an excerpt from the novel, The Rose of Bray's Bayou, will better explain this. Mrs. Almiron Dickinson reached Gonzales, Texas, with the tragic news. Mothers, wives, sweethearts, and dozens of children of the gallant and brave 32 men who left Gonzales a few weeks earlier and rode to the aid of the Alamo instantly surrounded the exhausted young woman. Their cries, their screaming, and many were collapsing to the ground, were absolutely frightening. All began asking with their trembling voices, Oh, Sue, Sue, please, they cried. Are you sure? Are you sure they're dead? Did they say anything? Did my husband have any last message for me? Susanna Dickinson had only this to say. All dead. All dead. She turned and saw standing shoulder to shoulder with the other women, Rebecca Davis, her very best friend. Rebecca, I can tell you about your son's last hour. I watched Johnny during the very height of the battle. He reached out to me in the Alamo church room where I was hiding. A Mexican soldier broke both of his jaws and he tried to say something, but I couldn't understand what he was saying. Both of his jaws were broken, but he was able to reach up with his hands and press his jaws together, but still, I couldn't understand what he was saying. And then... He rushed back out into the hailstorm of bullets. A hero, Rebecca. An honest-to-God hero. Well, on that dreadful day, there was not a family in the entire community of Gonzales, Texas, that didn't mourn the loss of a friend, a relative, or an immediate family member. At least 20 women, many of them with small children, were now widows. For many hours after Sue Dickinson brought the news, not a single sound was heard, except for the hysterical cries of the women and terrible screams of the fatherless children. No sooner did they receive the news, they were forced to flee Santa Ana's anticipated advance on the settlement. All were unprepared for the sudden exodus from Texas. Wagons were in short supply. Not wishing the elderly women and children to see their homes put the torch, Houston led them out of Gonzales and then ordered that no roof should be left standing. 
the mad rush to the Louisiana border was known to the Texans as the runaway scrape and to others the great runaway or even in other writings it's been known as the Sabine shoot. Whatever it's called, this wild exodus was a nightmare of terror and suffering for women. Another expert to try and cross Sims Bayou on Vince's Bridge comes from the novel. After a quick breakfast, all the wagons got in single file and continued their trek to the east. Maggie stood up in the wagon and couldn't believe her eyes. Panic etched itself across her face. Pleasant. We need to get across Sims Bayou. We need to get across now. Santa Ana is almost here. Are you listening? Are you listening, Pleasant? Dear, calm. D don't panic. I need you to take a deep breath, please. We're going to be fine. He's still several days behind us. I know. But stand up on the wagon. Stand up and look towards Vince's bridge. Can you believe what you're going to see? Look. Look how far we are from the bridge. There's not one vacant spot where there's not a wagon trying to get across. Pless didn't need to stand on the wagon. Everyone had come to an abrupt stop where one couldn't move forward to the left or even to the right. There were hundreds upon hundreds of wagons at a complete standstill. Maggie took a deep breath, stopped, turned her head to the heavens and whispered a small prayer. Then Maggie took a long breath, gathered her newfound strength, and pulled herself back together. Pleasant? I'm sorry. I don't know what's wrong. I I'm getting upset over everything. Sweetheart, we will pull through this together. I'm petrified with fear as well and can only imagine how you feel. It's okay to be scared, but we're together and we'll, with God's guidance, outrun those Mexican forces and that Mexican tyrant. You're right. I lost my faith for a short while but I've got it back. I'll be strong, Pleasant. We will be strong. So many people need our help. Then, no sooner than she had just said that we were going to get through it, there was a loud noise. Bam! Bam! Two loud shots echoed. A white puff of smoke billowed out of the man's double-barrel shotgun. Oh my God, Pleasant. Pleasant. He killed that man. Did you see that? He killed that man. She snapped her mouth shut, stunned by what she saw. Maggie continued to watch in awe. A woman knelt down by the man, straining her vocals, but nothing came out. Still, she screamed, hoping someone would hear her. Then, suddenly... Her body racked with raw sobs. She shook like that of a leaf, and fear consumed every cell in her body. She leaned over and buried her face in the dead man's chest. Well, I will have to take a quick little break, because you know how these producers are. They always want me to break my podcast right in the middle of some place to leave a short little message for you. So hang in there. And I'm coming back with part two of episode 12 of my podcast. Stay tuned. Have you heard about Anchor.fm by Spotify? It's the easiest way to make a podcast with everything you need all in one place. Yep. Anchor has the tools that will allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. And best of all, Anchor is totally free. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started.
It was awful for the women of Texas and their small children and their elderly parents to cross the open prairies and the swollen Trinity River. Everyone continued their journey as fast as they possibly can, and most it was in bare feet, lacerated and bleeding at almost every single step they made. The wet earth and the angry sky offered no relief. Six days out of Gonzales, there were other dangers than just a disease. One woman and her two children rode a horse that jumped into an overflowing creek and plummeted into the swift waters. Horrified refugees on both sides of the bank could only watch as the mother and her children were swept under by the swift current. A woman was transporting her invalid husband in their ox-drawn cart when a Texian foraging party sought to impress her team for the army. Aware that the loss of her oxen meant certain death for her disabled spouse, well, let's just put it this way. Let's go to an excerpt from the novel. The armed men rode swiftly into the encampment on their horses. One jumped off his horse and right next to Mary. Ma'am, I'm Captain Crockett. I'm Davy Crockett's nephew. We're anxiously trying to get to the Alamo and are in desperate need of your oxen to help us get our supplies to the Alamo. We're going to take yours. Whoa there, young fella. First of all, who's this Davy Crockett? No matter. The Alamo needs horses and oxen. I must commodore yours and be on our way. Mary Bright first turned and looked at Maggie and then back at the men again. She was amazed at their audacity to even ask, much less think, they could just ride up, take their oxen, and be on their merry way. And then she said, I will kill the first man that attempts to take my oxen. Patrick and Pleasant don't need to run and give aid to either of the two women. One of the men stepped forward, not heeding the warning Mary was giving him. Maggie stepped up to the man. My friend here is serious. She'll shoot you if you take one more step, I promise. And if she doesn't, I will. She walked a few steps over and grabbed the shotgun out of Pleasant's hands. Captain Crockett froze in the spot he was standing. He stared at the two women, stopped, turned around, and climbed back on his horse. He straightened up and pulled his coonskin cap down over his head, and he and his men, without further ado, rode off to the west in a continuing effort to reach the Alamo as soon as possible. Well, we're all too familiar with the Battle of San Jacinto and how it was a very short-fought battle and how after it was over, everyone began to head home. Uh, many of those who had damned Sam Houston as a cowardly drunk for the last month now praised him as the savior of Texas. After the Battle of San Jacinto, the women and their families could just head straight home, but their troubles were far from over. For many, the return trip was the hardest. The Mexicans were no longer a threat, but Mother Nature remained unrelenting. The women of Gonzales returned to their burned homes and ravaged fields. There was a lady by the name of Mrs. King, and this I got from the memoirs from Delu Rose Harris. Quicksand was a constant danger, and when the wind came up pretty strong, the refugees were buffeted by high waves. But worst of all, the waters were infested with alligators. That's right, lots of alligators. And Mrs. King's husband, having secured his family on dry land, swam back over to get the horses. Another expert from the novel, The Rose of Bray's Bayou. Well, Pleasant, one more trip. Only two horses left. He broke into a wide, gentle smile and looked over at his wife. Josie, stay here with these nice folks and I'll go get the other two horses. Ben, do we really need the other two horses? Why don't we just let them be? We've two now in our oxen. That's plenty. It's just not safe. 
Come on. Let's keep going. We will. We will need them when we get to Louisiana. I'll be okay. I'm, I'm fine. Just wait here for me. Ben walked up the bayou several hundred feet and with the swift current began swimming across. By the time the current pushed him down the bayou, he ended up almost in front of his two horses. He walked up to the muddy shore and waved back at everyone on the east side of the bayou. Then Ben did the same thing and walked his horses up the bayou before swimming back with them. He tied the reins together and began his swim across. Josie was watching attentively. Her husband began his trek back, and then all of a sudden she threw her hands up and grabbed the side of her head and screamed, My God, Ben, swim, swim, Ben. An alligator's swimming right for you. Hurry! She choked back a cry, frightened, electrified by the event. Time passed in slow motion. Josie stood frozen, her heart pounding in her chest. No words came from any of the others, who moaned loudly at what was happening in front of their very eyes. There was nothing they could do about it. They held their breath. Each second seemed like to last an eternity. At that moment, the giant gator twisted and spun and huge tail slammed down on top of Ben, knocking him in completely unconscious. Someone, please, someone help my husband. Hurry! Her scream tore through the onlookers like an enormous shard of glass. Their eyes widened and their pulses quickened. Patrick Wills was the only one that was holding a shotgun while standing next to the bayou. He emptied both barrels into the alligator, but the lead just seemed to bounce right off. You know, the runaway scrape had a profound and lasting effect on our early Texans. The Texas women of the runaway scrape justifiably could regard themselves as veterans of the Texas Revolution. They endured dangers and they endured hardships as harsh as those faced by their soldier husbands. Yet, while not as commonly lauded, their efforts were important. Santa Ana had made no secret of his objective. He was determined to rid Texas of all foreigners. His campaign, it ended on April 21st, 1836. But the victory on the banks of Buffalo Bayou would have meant little if the families had disintegrated amid the chaos. So, largely, it fell to the mothers to hold them together and instill values required to survive on the frontier. Therefore, the women of the runaway scrape were better known as the midwives who served at the birth of the Texas Republic. Well, that does it for me for another great episode from Sydney St. James. Be sure to click on the tab above that says send a voice message and I will get it from you and I'll probably play it back on one of my future podcasts. Also, don't forget to click the button follow. I'd love for you to follow my podcast. But it's been fun. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And until next time, here I am, Sydney St. James. Happy listening.